itself, when you see the lecture slide of the process, to know that at this slide I made this and this. Ah. And so That's what I use the tablet for. <laughs> okay. It's just you who does the crazy three hour run for four days. And Eugene now too, but <laughs> I can fit it under two hours. <laughs> <laughs> two hours Yeah, I didn't see it inside. I thought it might have been cancelled. That's why I messaged you, <laughs> actually. So the only one that on there was the Sydney uh, Monte Carlo Center. Yeah. The guy who yeah, runs yeah. this seminar is just not organized at all. <laughs> <laughs> talking to us about complex networks and not only complex networks but Malaysian complex networks. <laughs> yeah. so I expect that Mostly. they are going to be more tasty, not as blunt as the Australian one. <laughs> um, but we will see uh, what she actually has to say about that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to mention that this is PowerPoint. Thomas. <laughs> so <laughs> He's running away because of that. But, you know, our environment supports PowerPoint more than other things. So <laughs> I'm just using what we have. Anyway, so uh, I am going to talk very quickly about many things that we have done. Uh, if you are interested in anything in particular in detail, you can come talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's not, uh, not only networks, maybe hopefully some persistent homology or TDA at the end, if we have time. Okay, so uh, networks, uh, you know this, um, so I don't have to explain. So this was what initially got me into epidemiological modeling, well, networked epidemiology, they say, uh, because of COVID. Uh, so I was uh, on attachment with Maybank, the largest uh, bank in Malaysia, and um, for six months. Uh, so they asked me to explain it to them, <laughs> like mathematically, you know. So I, so the CEO, Dato Nora, uh, he, she is the boss of the HR boss at Maybank. Uh, so I was attached under her. Uh, I was under her under the program called CEO at Faculty. So these four a faculty from other universities were also attached to her but it was for leadership training they say uh, so I was working at Maybank during <laughs> pandemic technically and then uh, but because I was an outsider they couldn't let me have external Maybank data at home so I said I have to do something I'll teach you some math maybe so I, I said, okay, I'll try to explain what's happening. So these are the slides that I took from the internet and say, okay, these are centralities and imagine uh, these are investors in your bank or something. So I have something more on that. But uh, they, firstly, they wanted to know about um, the epidemic. So I said, uh, well, these are graphs. These are degree, I think everybody knows this. And I said, there's something called between the centrality that can measure who are the connectors in the network. 
So I said, OK, this is a graph from uh, Neil Ferguson Imperial College, my alma mater for PhD. And you know, from this graph, I think they got the cartoon of the flattening of the curve. Uh, so that's probably where the cartoon is from, although I don't really know exactly. But I think this is one of the earliest ones that was out in the Imperial papers. It's not even uh, at that time, it was just on the Imperial website. They pushed it out really quickly. And uh, so I said, OK, so this is the simulation, and that's why how they got the cartoon. And so I said, uh, there's a normal SIR model, and then there's the, but more realistically, if you can model it, there's the contact networks. If you know the contact network, you can model it more realis realistically. So at the time, I had contact networks of my students. I say it's contact network, but it's actually a network. Uh, where I force my student to tell me who are their friends in their class. They have to <laughs> list. Uh, I had like 148 students, very big class. Uh, and I said, hmm. Uh, so it was collected physically. And if we open the class, what would happen if the uh, uh, COVID spreads or epidemic spreads to their friends? Um, something like that. So I did some simulations on this and I said, well, if you monitor by degree, 20% the highest degree or 1%, 2%, you can flatten the, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the, you can flatten the infection curve. And then, and I said, monitoring by between centrality is much more effective in this case. Uh, you can flatten it to almost nothing and that's, that 1% is just because my simulation, I put it, it had to be at least one. Yeah, you test. Like I imagine that you can test them every day. So if you know the full network, and then you know the highest degree people and highest between the centrality people, so uh, monitor one percent is you just monitor the one top one percent. So in this case, it's uh, two people uh, or one point five two people. You round up and then you test them. So if they're positive, you take them out of the network or you know quarantine them. So you're testing that fraction on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or highest between the centrality one. So in the highest degree one, uh, it obviously will reduce it, but not as fast as monitoring the highest between the centrality one. But of course, this is 20%. This is already quite big. Uh, and there's a big jump at 10%, I think. Yeah, the purple one. So that was fun. Uh, I also um, did like a friendship paradox where you don't need to have a network, right? You just uh, ask uh, a person, like, um, because uh, using the friendship paradox, your friend is always, your friend on average always has more friends than you. Uh, so if you ask one person and then say, please nominate a more popular or, you know, your friend <laughs> or something, uh, you will eventually get to the higher degree at least. So we tried to use the friendship paradox uh, to, in this case, we, didn't work as well as the between the centrality, but it, it was better than slightly some other things. Is yeah. That just, that just it was just one step. Yeah, I didn't go many, many steps. Uh, the one step didn't, wasn't brilliantly well, but may, maybe many steps would be better. I didn't push forward. Uh, that's not actually my idea. That's, that was an idea I saw by Nicholas Christakis yeah. on his YouTube channel. So I was like, OK, friendship paradox. Yeah, uh, so I used that. Also, uh, it didn't work very well. That's why I didn't have the slide. Yeah, this one looks nice. <laughs> I didn't check uh, because at the time, I mean, it was just one realization of the network. So I said, like, mm, probably I need to check with many different networks first before I like generalize to anything more detailed. <laughs> but it was just like, this is a strategy that you can adapt if you want to keep your people in 150, uh, 150 people in the room safe, something like that. So I titled it reopening strategies or something. Yeah, so that was a simple paper I thought because I was just 
hearing about COVID every day and I had this friendship student data. I was like, I have to do this. I have to get it out of my head. So <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah, uh, so this paper was written with uh, Paul Expert, who's, uh, who is currently at UCL. He is a senior lecturer in global business health something faculty. Uh, he's a lecturer of health analytics, so he knows some of this stuff, although his background is complex systems and networks. And then, ah, so I did a video also explaining this stuff in Malay and English. And the first video, the Malay video, won some awards from the minister. And they were like, oh, good job explaining math. So I was quite happy because math won. And the second video was on social science and stuff. So, But it was in Malay, so I guess nobody else from other universities sent any entries. Number one was my university, number two was my university, and number three was also from UKM. <laughs> Uh, but my VC was quite happy about it, so yeah. And then I tried to send stuff to like Tri, Tri Blue One Brown, he's my favorite math YouTuber, and we're just here. Just I paid someone to do the videos, so uh, that was fun for my research grant. So, <laughs> uh, so that led to me applying to do this fellowship here with Michael, and that's why I'm here. I'm doing this. Uh, the title of my project is Enhancing Pandemic Preparedness, Modeling Control Manager and Population Interaction with Networks. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm going back on the last day of uh, Ramadan, actually. <laughs> or, or not, who knows? Depends on the moon. Uh, or maybe the first day of uh, Eid, we'll see. <laughs> we call it Shawwal, the month. Uh, so, um, and I chose this day because I still have to do teaching work. <laughs> So uh, the, U the university was happy to let me go uh, as long as I still do stuff at UKM. So that's why I'm here, if you're wondering why I'm suddenly here. Uh, but the more interestingly is the network underlying it, the friendship network. Uh, this is actually with characteristics. So the squares are males. <laughs> so the circles of females, so as you can see, it's more than 75% female. <laughs> and the different colors are different ethnicity. As you can see, it's quite differentiated by ethnicity. And this is not even weighted. If it's like, if I highlight the weight, it will be even more. I'll explain what the weight is uh, at a later time. So I haven't really figured out how to explain this nicely yet <laughs> because of the racial divide and uh, um, you know, the interaction. But I'm still thinking, uh, talking to Paul a lot now on how to do this. Yeah. So that's actually the student data. And um, so a digraph, but we have, so we don't only have the friendship network, we also have the peer to the network. It's in the same questionnaire, but you ask them a different question. So for the friendship network, you ask them, who are your friends? For the peer to the network, you ask them, who do you refer to academically in this class? Who do you ask help? for in this class. So the good thing is we see many in more inter ethnicity interaction in the peer tutoring network <laughs> than the friendship network. So they know that they have to work together. Uh, but also we find that uh, they don't really refer to the people that you think are smart. It is in pink here, high scorers. Uh, 49 is not as good a scorer as the others, but he or she might be willing and able to teach or just has more friends that he or she can influence. Okay, that's one thing. But then we looked in more detail. Yeah, sure. Which one's the high scores? Uh, the pink, sorry. My student chose pink. So just those two are Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. That's not the numbers. Yeah, the numbers are just labels for the students. Yeah, and then there's one student who doesn't even communicate with everyone else, and then two people that just talk to each other. So the friendship network was completely connected, but the peer tutoring network is, I guess they answered truthfully. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so these are uh, same students as the friendship network, yeah? Okay, so at least the friendship network was completely connected, but you know, in this case, I guess maybe uh, some of them stay outside of the campus so they don't really talk to their friends that much. Anyway, so uh, we 
So during COVID, uh, so these were first year and so we couldn't continue data collection. But I thought I want some longevity, you know, when they were third year. So this data was collected when they were first year. And then um, when they were uh, third year, they were already separated in different classes. But I could get like a subset of them. So we focused on a subset of them in their third year during COVID. So we made an online form. So it's, the form is something like this, list your friends. So we, we made, uh, we had 10, 10 friends. So the closest, second closest, third closest. So the closest one would be like the heaviest weight, I suppose, uh, the highest weight. So that's why I say if you put the weighted uh, network, it might even be more ethnic, ethnically and racially divided, let's say, yeah? Uh, so this is friendship and there's a peer tutoring questionnaire as well. So we did an online questionnaire and we made it in JOT form because at that time the Google form didn't have autofill or something like that. So we used JOT form uh, and you know we copyrighted it and everything and the questionnaire. And I, I did also this in another university who, with just one race <laughs> uh, at that university. Uh, so we're also trying to compare how the dynamics are different there. So this is a subset of the original data, but now they're in the third year. So, uh, so the friendship network and the peer tutoring network, and these are the marks. Uh, so the dark uh, um, green color, the higher their marks, and the lighter color, the less um, their marks are. So in the friendship network, uh, 21 is popular. So I guess that's why he or she is also still a popular uh, peer tutor. <laughs> and um, uh, 34 gets bigger. Uh, so he, he or she teaches more people. And um, there are some differences. But in order to see the differences better, we plotted it like this. Uh, so. Uh, Peer tutor here, friendship there. So you say, okay, these people are teaching more people in the class than just their friends, right? So maybe uh, if you're a lecturer, we can focus on these people to get them, the, give them the correct information, and you know, get their marks up so they can teach other people and get other people's marks up. Uh, <laughs> you know, focus your effect, focus your, uh, focus your energy on these few people. Okay, so that's the in-degree, but what's interesting is between the centrality. Okay, so between the centrality, this is the top score in the class. Definitely bigger. He wasn't, he or she wasn't bigger in the degree. Yeah, uh, but 35 for some reason, maybe he or she is a good explainer or something. So, uh, so maybe the top scorer, uh, people from uh, different ethnicity or friendship group refer to he or she because they know that he or she is smart, right? Uh, so 19 is smart. So uh, that's where we, that's how we can capture um, who's actually teaching to different groups. Yeah. So um, again, we plotted it, and then we can see that 19 and 35 are like the outliers in terms of peer tutoring, uh, connecting people in terms of knowledge. So they are teaching different groups. So I guess they are more, probably more important than the degree in, a sen in the sp super spreader sense, knowledge super spreader sense. Yeah, so uh, that was interesting. And uh, um, we didn't do any other analysis on that, just highlighting on these two, we thought that it was interesting too. It's like, this is a tool if you're a teacher, you can probably focus your attention on these people. Yes, and uh, so we're trying, still trying to do more things with the data that we have uh, and see what we can do along gender lines or maybe racial interaction lines. Yeah, okay, so that's one type of data. And then another type of data, so uh, this is a work I've done with my friend from the Maybank Fellowship Attachment. Uh, she had to listen to my uh, lecture on <laughs> networks, so suddenly she was like, ah, you're good in that, let's publish a paper together. Uh, so I didn't do much in this paper, but I told them, there's Gephi, use Gephi. Uh, and so <laughs> in this paper, they 
uh, have a co-occurrence meta network analysis showing correlation between species and ARG. I'm not exactly sure what ARG is, but there were some uh, bacteria in common with the so you take the species of the ARG and then look at how many bacteria they have in common. There's a threshold. They have a few bacteria in common. You connect them, and then so these are effluent and what's the other one? Influent is just water beef coming into the what do you call that? Filtering plants, like dirty where dirty water goes. Yeah, and then the water after they cleaned it in those plants. So she's like uh, in this field, so a biologist. So she thought, yeah, using network to visualize it will be interesting. Uh, and then she um, just asked me to help with using Gephi and stuff. So they said, oh, okay, look, it's different like that. Um, so this was the work I did with FISA here. So this is the four of us, the fellows at uh, Maybank at the time, CEO of faculty. Um, so what I told them at Maybank is, um, so I taught them, of course, because you know I can't do anything else. Their data is secret. I can't go there. I was at home. So I said, I'll, I'll volunteer to teach you a class. So human, I taught a class called Humanizing Data Through Networks because Maybank's tagline is humanizing banking. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, although it works, I think. Uh, I might have to copyright that. Uh, but next, so I thought, People from all over the world involving Hong Kong, Filipino, Singapore, people, they were online and stuff. So uh, I told them, if you have financial transaction network, you can find like who's the highest witness centrality at least, uh, and who has the highest degree. And if, um, if uh, you know uh, during, at that time, you know which company to support in order, so to, in order to prevent the supply chain from collapsing, you can support these um, small entities. Um, and I did some analysis with them, but I can't say anything because it's PNC. Um, but I don't think they pursued the direction anyway. But uh, some of them listened quite interesting, interestingly. Uh, but I think they pursued more of a direction of AI application. Okay, so yeah. Uh, let's see, but uh, the only data that I have is like stock markets. So we just look at stock markets, find correlation, and look at something like that. And then this paper uh, during COVID, if we compare year by year, um, uh, after COVID we find, uh, so this one is not correlation. We actually use ranger causality and transfer entropy to find like the direct directed network. So. Uh, and we got that uh, insurance company was just getting more and more causal in this sense. So that was interesting. Um, so, uh, so because uh, I was reading a lot of uh, uh, the Strogatz paper and I saw that they did stuff on the Hollywood network. So, uh, and one of my final year students came to me and was like, oh, I really like K-pop, I want to do K-pop. And no, no, you're not doing K-pop, you're doing Malay movies. So, uh, <laughs> this is her undergraduate project, finally published as when she's a PhD student. <laughs> so, uh, she's now my PhD student and this is her first paper. Uh, so, and also with Paul. Uh, so, we have data, at she diligently collected data on Malay, Movies, as in movies acted in predominantly predominantly Malay language, yeah. So, uh, so I thought it was fun. Uh, so, actually, these are the actors, and we see that uh, we wanted to find the Kevin Bacon of the Malay uh, language movies. Uh, so that was fun. Um, actually, I didn't know most of these people. Just one, but now I do. Okay. And uh, we found that uh, the animation industry is actually quite big in Malaysia. There's a cartoon called Upinipin, which makes me very famous if I ever go to Indonesia because they hear, they hear my accent. I was like, say some more things because you sound like the cartoon. Um, so the animation industry is <laughs> getting quite huge in Malaysia and our cartoons are exported to, well, at least Disney Channel in Asia or something like that. So. Uh, people that act in the animations um, tend to go into acting in other fields. So this Remy S. Hart guy, he's quite multi-talented, so he acts in many genres. So his between and centrality is quite high, uh, even animations and musicals and stuff. 
so I guess he's quite Kevin Bacon light, but uh, yeah, so we highlighted, uh, so in the end we chose Pekin Ibrahim because he's like older than Remy is her and he, he's not always the hero, he's kind of like the bad guy maybe, some, maybe one or two movies he's the hero, uh, so quite Kevin Bacon like. So the people who does network in Malaysia is like, yeah, yeah, he's like Kevin Bacon in our um, actor networks. So that was quite fun. Right. So it's not all fun and games. Oh, but uh, I also have a GitHub. But uh, if you want the data, you can go to the GitHub. Uh, my Najwa has diligently <laughs> compiled it and updated it uh, for like almost three years from her ma undergraduate master's in PhD. So uh, there's uh, data here that is not available anywhere else as a data set, I think. And also, um, because uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics was attributed to complex system, I've been using this a lot in my presentation. I don't know if you have, but I have. And um, so, because I looked at Giorgio Parisi's work and I was like, huh, it's not very different from what I did during, well, it is different from what I did during my PhD, but I, I can actually understand it to a certain extent. Um, disclaimer, I've never read any of his paper. I just look at the title in the abstract. Yeah. But uh, so I gave a talk on this also on my YouTube channel, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. But what I so I also have other talks on my YouTube channel. Um, but why we were so proud because I am the founding member of Asian Network of Complexity Scientists, uh, founded uh, 2014, and I've been going back to NTU every year. NTU in Nanyang Technological University every year uh, until COVID. <laughs> and then COVID happened, and I think the Complexity Institute also closed down. So I'm not really sure what's happening with that. But <laughs> uh, we've met online. Uh, but uh, Chik Dem here from Turkey, she has been proactively um, creating a website with all of these names. So uh, there's one from Australia, um, but I don't think she does it much network Sarah Russell if you're looking for people for network science and there's also another one John Locke I think he does a few network things do you know these people yeah so if you want to reach out for your network science um, bid yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the information later so yeah we have this uh, working group we call it uh, and we have a website uh, that is um, uh, coordinated by Chidem from Istanbul and she's also a member of the Complex System Society. Uh, well, I am too, but she's like the executive member and actively going to meetings and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this is from the website, uh, from our few meetings and they also visited uh, my group which is called Complex Network Topological Data Analysis Group, more on that later. So Achep was visiting and we're taking picture with the author of uh, the book called An uh, Einstein di Malaya. Uh, the, uh, or the English meaning is when Einstein was in Malaya. <laughs> so that was a fun read. Uh, it's in Malay, unfortunately, but I can translate some of the content you want. So that's Prof. Roslan. He's uh, at physics department. And also Chidem was in Malaysia for quite long, a month or so. And we brought her to like a uh, durian uh, play uh, where nearby, at the university nearby, at this hotel. The hotel has a farm also, and uh, we also have an MOU at their hotel because the, the, manage, the boss is an imperial alumni, and he's always very happy to welcome <laughs> any <laughs> of his imperial uh, alumni to his hotel. So that's where we brought her, and he gave, that all, uh, he gave a warm welcome at the hotel. So that that's uh, our group at UKM. So Compact System. Uh, I know nobody will usually agree on the definition, but this is the one I took from my supervisor's book, Henrik Jensen of Imperial. <laughs> so uh, let's see, one hour, okay. So you can loosely define it as this. So uh, criticality, you can say that it's the emergence of components to work together as one. I'm sure you all know this, you know, like phase transition, water becomes vapor or uh, ice. Yes, and then, so this is Giorgio Parisi. Uh, I googled him and put that he applies to schematics and property theory, and this is from his Nobel Prize lecture on YouTube. Uh, he said that uh, large-scale simulation or spin glasses, so spin glasses is a generalization of uh, easing model, if you, or Ising model. Uh, initially, I called it Ising model, and then when I went to Imperial, Henrik told me it's actually pronounced easing. So 
I guess easing is the correct way to pronounce the model. Uh, I have worked on this problem uh, for more than 20 years. Giorgio Parisi said he considered that numerical simulations may have the same connective value as experiments. Uh, so that's good because you know you don't have to be an experimentalist to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so <laughs> I just wanted to highlight that and push the case forward for mathematics as well. Anyway, uh, so this is the easing model. Uh, spin out, spin down, and um, I use this as like the simplest complex system because it has like the phase transition in it. And this was a paper I wrote with my supervisor, Aaron Virial, Henrik Jensen, quantifying causality in complex system. It has no data application, but it's just modeling and simulations. So that's why I thought, ah, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the spin glass is like an extension of easy model. Anyway, so more recently, uh, critical slowing down is said to happen as something near cr criticality. So if you have like a macro state from uh, gas to solid or liquid, and then you, in the financial world, you can say that it's a normal to crisis, or when it involves flooding, you can say flood or non-flood, so different micro state. Uh, the warning or the approaching to the critical transition can, you can use CSD indicators, uh, which is the autocorrelation, the variance and mean power spectrum. Um, so this is how you use it. I'm not an expert on it. I'm o I only applied it, but it seems to give quite good results in terms of detecting uh, the change or approach to criticality. So first you compute these indicators, which are uh, autocorrelation, lag one, variance, and mean power spectrum. And you analyze the trends and you compare to a control period that's far from this transition and then you do some sort of robustness analysis. So this is the first paper that only does uh, critical slowing down. Uh, but then you continue this paper, we add critical slowing down with persistent homology, and it does better than without persistent homology. So we say that in this case, persistent homology is a good addition uh, to help better detection of critical transition in flood, non-flood. So for the flooding, we use I don't know. Um, there's one is water level, and another is river speed. Something from the uh, Klantan River. Okay, so that's a flow chart. So, yeah, but we have time series. You have to reconstruct it, taken to have to to make it into a point cloud, and then you use persistent homology on the re reconstructed data, and then you do all the topological data analysis here, and then you use the L1 norm from the TDA to detect the critical slowing down indicators on that, and then you do the, the normal estimation for early warning system. So there's a lot of steps in there. And then um, this one is uh, similar steps. Well, actually, this one was first before the flood one. Uh, so Sabri, Dr. Sabri, now he works at, the, at, at our place, UKM, uh, uh, does um, uh, publish this, early warning signals financial crisis using persistent homology in Physica A. And so he, this is him explaining persistent homology. Uh, and then persistent barcode, persistent diagram, persistent landscape. And then he uses this persistent landscape to get L1 and use the L1 data for prediction of the crisis, and it's a bit better than not using the L1 data, although there are, there are some arguments in paper if you read it. Yeah, so, uh, but what he does, he doesn't use, uh, I think Eugene asked me this question, he doesn't use any uh, phase-based reconstruction, he just combines the uh, a few stock markets data and consider that this is, and, uh, imagine that it's four dimension, this is four dimension, this is four dimension, and this is three dimension, and then just get the L1 norm from that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I wasn't really sure about that, but, well, okay. So, that was what uh, Sabri did. Um, uh, seems to work. He's been cited quite a bit. And then um, he also wrote this one, uh, uh, the correlation test and on Bitcoin also. Um, and um, same technique, I think, L1 norms, yeah. And then um, 
that's one part of uh, how we use persistent homology in our research group. And another part is that we use it to um, explain classification and clustering. Uh, so uh, classification, I think the definition is used to label data and clustering is to group similar data. So uh, this is Sabri's paper also, another of his paper where he uh, used persistent homology to predict whether the stock will go up or down. So that's, uh, this is uh, also a highly cited paper, Applied Soft Computing General. People seem to like it. Uh, but you use the same L1 norm, but just to predict it, with, uh, use machine learning together with persistent homology to give better predictions of whether the stock will go up or down. Yeah. And then uh, this is Fariha's paper. Uh, no, this is Sabri's paper. He's now teaching at Sunway University, which is a university that has a lot of money and stealing a lot of people from public universities, if I'm honest. Yeah. <laughs> Just recently, I think a professor from our university moved to Sunway. Uh, so um, he does a prediction on stream flow data. Uh, this is Fariha's paper, a PhD student uh, currently teaching at USM, University of Science Malaysia. She, she came with USM scholarship. Uh, and I wanted to do topology, but um, <laughs> uh, I think she ended up doing applied mathematics rather than pure mathematics because she does TDA and not exactly topology. Uh, but she uses um, cluster analysis in addition to persistent homology and finds that it's better than just the normal cluster analysis, essentially. Yeah. So um, uh, this is her uh, haka. Hierarchical agglomerative something clustering algorithm maybe I think I forgot but it's quite popular Hakka so uh, so usually this is the traditional Hakka and this is the hybrid Hakka she said that you use the you face uh, use Tekken's method to get many dimensions and then you use persistent homology and you use western distance and then you get better classification. Many steps, <laughs> I know, many more steps, but better classification in the end is what we claim. Right? Uh, and then uh, most recently, Amina, she's still a PhD student, but she's uh, uh, already a lecturer at uh, UATM. She came to us as a lecturer. So she was already looking at uh, breast cancer uh, mammogram. So we use, uh, she normally just use uh, machine learning to classify whether the images are um, benign or malignant, right? So f just from the mammogram, can you tell whether the images are benign or malignant? What we found out is that if you add persistent homology to this machine learning methods, it does better um, and the prediction is more accurate. Yeah, so, and she's also writing another paper on how to denoise these things uh, using persistent homology. Uh, submitted to IEEE access, I think. Anyway, uh, so this is also another PhD student uh, currently with us just to see how everything how we got to TDA. Uh, so let's just say I came from here, complex networks, and then probably you came from here, <laughs> the ecosystem, and Prof Salmi, also my mentor, came from here, and then Amina came from image processing, uh, and what Fariha is doing is uh, clustering algorithm, and then uh, all these other things, uh, time series analysis uh, is uh, interesting to see. Uh, this uh, different interaction and how we were led to TDA. Anyway, uh, so I hope one day Malaysia will be there, but so far we're not there yet. Australia is there. Well done. Okay. <laughs> well, of course, the States is the biggest one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so, so these are the groups. Um, I, I initially, I only know Petri G, so that, because that's Giovanni, my friend from PhD now is a professor at uh, Network Science Institute of, I don't know, Northeastern or Northwestern, where Barbasi is. So it's like in the same page as Barbasi, but he's in London now. So it's like, oh, professor, uh, well done. Uh, so he, I think he got professorship writing on a lot of phenomenology and TDA stuff. So well done, Giovanni. And uh, his uh, collaborator is uh, Francesco, Francesco Vaccarino. He's a 
POMF, Professor I think in Topology from Torino, uh, which I visited a few years ago. So uh, there's two people that I really know, but I guess they're not really communicating with the bigger group. <laughs> or may, but Giovanni did attend Castle's talk and all that, but just not publishing together. So it's not in this uh, data set because this data set is a network of people publishing together, extracted under the name persistent homology, under the search keyword persistent homology. Um, that's a very short summary of my talk, and this is uh, a group. So this is Giovanni, Professor Giovanni now. Uh, this is Paul. This is Michael. He was a he's a Newman. Do you know Newman book? Uh, he's the PhD student of Newman. Currently, he's working in Singapore. So uh, meet him quite often. This is my supervisor, Henrik Jensen, the leader of Center for Complex Design at Imperial College. It wasn't called that when I was studying there, but currently it's called that. Uh, so these are my two PhD students. This is uh, uh, he's the one working at Sunway University now, uh, and this is uh, the first WCNTDA that we held in 2019. So there's some people from Philippines, Indonesia, and a lot of from Malaysian University and multidisciplinary and these are the people that I usually have multidisciplinary collaboration with from the Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Economy, uh, Social Sciences not so much. Uh, so the second WCNTDA was online, uh, two of the sessions were in Malay but, uh, but two were in English and this was Paul again I think. Um, so uh, we had online, it's on my YouTube channel if you want to watch and the Third one was recently, as you can see, the, it's getting more and more female dominated, just like the students. Um, but <laughs> yeah, some boys behind there. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so this is uh, Dr. Sabri, who wrote the financial stuff. And, um, and these are my frequent collaborator, Dr. Munira. She does actuarial science. Dr. Azmin, she does a lot of bio mechanics, but she wants to explore physical homology. And, my PhD students, my undergraduate student, master student that I forced to come. So, <laughs> uh, and also people from other universities that were interested uh, because I just gave it free, essentially. So, uh, well, very cheap, no, not completely free because UKM will be angry at me, uh, but it was highly <laughs> sponsored. Not free UKM, um, but that's uh, the latest one, and, but oh no, not the latest one, but the latest one in Malaysia, but recently I went to HLF, Heidelberg Laureate Forum, uh, also did that, uh, gave the, the more or less the same talk, but longer version, because you guys are already expert, I didn't really explain things one by one, uh, so I gave also a talk at HLF uh, about this. And uh, this is my group, and this is just my papers there uh, on ORCID. And then that's it. If anyone wants to ask me more about mathematical details, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the audience before I ask my questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, this one, or so maybe this one. Was there any um, was there any similarities between the testing distributions in the friendship dataset and the predator? Yes. So that one and the other one. Um, and the tutoring one. Yeah, like so this. Yeah. Um, because um, is that is there an ethnic component in here? Yeah. And oh yeah. Then, so it's not. <laughs> Uh, I just am not sure how to highlight that yet <laughs> and tell the story. <laughs> We're working on that. Yeah, it is. It was still robust. Yeah, it's just a fact. I mean, homophilia is just a fact. We just need to learn how to make it um, a strength. Well, I don't know whether you can. Every time you get new students every semester, you just ask them to show this, and then you get a longer period to I know that is the ideal world, but even this, I had to like pay them. <laughs> to build the online one, you had to fill, pay them. The physical, you know, you get your PhD student or master student to chase them. But if it's online, you got to bribe them. Oh. Yeah. I could, but 
you know. <laughs> and then they will report it to you, Cam. <laughs> this lecture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But still, uh, we don't want to review too much because we're afraid that they might be identified because this network is quite small. <laughs> The other one. Some, some of the tutors were, or some of the hyper tutors weren't actually that strong students, <coughs> um, but they were just happy to teach. teach. Mm. Um, did, is there a correlation between those? And the, is there a mark? Is there a performance correlation between tutors and tutees? Ah, actually, I think in this paper. Uh, we did add up their f their two T's mark. Yep. There is some, not so much, I think. Yeah. Good question. Do tutors tend to be higher performing than two T's? No, not not in general, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, not not generally. We also have that in the paper. Not really. <laughs> it's not significant. Maybe he or she is usually top scorer, but he's just has primary problems or something. I don't know. <laughs> the previous one? Mm -hmm. The one before this. Or was it like the bigger network? Okay. Here? <laughs> I don't think there's any more after this. Yeah. Here? Okay. Yeah, that's the ethnicity divide. <laughs> mm. Yeah, 19 is top scorer. Yes. So the 19's friends seem uh, successful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In other subjects, maybe. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I think I think he or she is like active in class and has leadership qualities. <laughs> I mean, the the interesting thing is that you can identify that before you get the marks. So, from a teacher perspective, as you said, we don't know that nineteen is that good. We just know this is the peer network that they have, and well, how do you actually judge? whether a student is good or not before you actually set an exam. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, you can <coughs> start to ask really deep or stupid questions. Yes. You, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. judge that a little bit. Yes, they are. They are. They are. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by a peer tutor when they are doing the kind of thing by the tutor. Somebody can ask a question about the most little part of whatever else. Yeah, I, I think our question is who do you refer to academically with I within the class? If you have a problem, who do you ask basically? Yeah, in the class. Well, usually you just send an email to the lecture. Well, it's not a good idea because you don't teach in the class, you just teach three students and then just teach everyone Yeah, that's probably, you know, influencers these days. You just and teach the influencers. Maybe. The uh, lousy ones. <laughs> the lousy ones. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, we think this is, uh, I, I'm proposing that, you know, maybe if we have a good enough tool, the lecturers can just do this in the beginning or something. <laughs> but yeah, so it's kind of uh, a good way, I think, to make our teaching more efficient <laughs> and the knowledge spreading more efficient. Next time, yeah, exactly. 
if we have the energy to get it, yes, the data. Know, I mean, you can tell from an educated point of view, of course, in mathematics, we know if you did bad for a couple of years, you're never going to be the best students that we've ever seen. Yeah? Because, I mean, you missed so much of the stuff before. Yeah? But um, there is a question of whether you actually want to do that with the class, because you are basically just saying, um, you are not a good student. Yeah. So well, I don't it. approach you, I instead approach that guy back there. Yeah? So, um, is it to tell the British bar to not come to class anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, more dangerous is this 12. He's <laughs> giving knowledge to people who then just rarely pass. So, I mean, that's, that is the one where I would think, okay, and, and he's also teaching something like 17. <laughs> where you think well, 17 you know, just listens to, don't do that. Whatever this guy says, I do the opposite. Is, it, is, the other way, is 12 learning from 17? Yeah, 12, 12 is learning, 12 points to 17, 17 is the peer to the or 12, yeah. <laughs> With 12. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, 23, it's in both directions. Yeah, yes. So, I mean, okay. I can zoom in, <laughs> if that helps. Which one? Here. Here, this is friendship, this is peer to tail. So peer to tail is here. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul is teaching 17, yeah? Uh, 12 refers to 17. Oh, so right. this so is like points to the uh, peer to tail. I mean, at least there is a two way. Yeah. Direction. So yeah, this so one is a two way. Yeah. It also top they scorer. Don't teach, they mm. don't teach, but the results are more consistent than 35. Uh, 19 is the top in the class, so that's why everybody refers to 19. <laughs> Maybe he or she is already well known as the smart kid. <laughs> is this the, is this the, okay, it's a first year class, right? No, it's third year already. The first year was when okay. the friendship network, yeah. Uh, Subset to that and online yeah. during COVID. Yeah, 19 refers to 17 as well. I guess they're two good students, so they refer to each other. But 17, I'm not sure what it looks like. It's not referring to 19. But I mean, this kind of cluster is something that we quite often see as well in our classes that the good guys start to clump together and I remember a couple of years ago, I had one of these classes where they, they, they were just running wild and um, they all worked together. Yeah? So quite often you have that kind of structure. And I think if you think about clustering in this network, you would mm. see if you cluster according to results. That they also well, actually, we tried that, but the cluster is more race-based, ethnicity. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're, that's why we're trying to explain it. But that's a good idea. I could compare whether it's more or more mark based as they grow from first year to third year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah, actually, we're also trying to filter it out, uh, doing something with Paul, see if we can filter it out. Yeah. Yeah, so let's interesting data which requires uh, many hard work uh, collecting. <laughs> uh. So my two questions. Uh, first question is how can you run an Asian network or complex system network mm -hmm. thing as a coordinator if you do universities on the wrong side? Of the <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, we overlook that because she's so, okay, so you, you hard working. <laughs> Turkey. Partially oh, Asian, Turkey. it's okay. Um, that's, 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 that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when, um, more serious question is when you look at this flooding stuff, uh -huh. um, your persistent homology, okay. what is the time resolution of your data? Ah, that's, I, it's a shifting window of like 50 days or something. Yeah. So it's daily data. Mm. So, mm -hmm. okay, it still works because. Um, all the flooding data that I know is also on daily basis. It's daily, yeah, that's what I we have. I always assume that uh, the time resolution is not 
good enough to... Um, yeah, it's not that great, if I'm honest, but it's... Slow down or yeah, something like yeah. that. Um, I always thought yeah, it's a little bit iffy, but okay, if you say that works, then I have to read the paper. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from your side? No? If not, then let's thank Fatima again. Okay, thank you. I suppose you won't have time to do this very close. No, it requires effort. I would just focus and do that for my class. <laughs> Post it online somewhere and yeah. do that somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do that once. So it's set to record for the next hour just in case. Oh, right. That's, that's how it works. It okay. It takes, takes a while to um, get <laughs> All right. You'll system. have to edit then. I just, yeah, I just chop off the start at the end. On YouTube? Uh, yes. I just like, you know, I can, once I get it from here, I can just delete yeah. the, the, the non right, content okay. on either end. Thank you. Just whatever's in there is in there. Mm-hmm.